Hello, I'm Ivan Sage. I worked for the Essex Chronicle from 1978 to 2008, first as a compositor and then as a, a feature writer, sub-editor. And I'm here today to meet Primrose Mini. So Primrose, you were a trainee reporter at the Essex Chronicle uh, from 1951 until 1953 in the Chelmsford High Street offices. Uh, perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit, bit about your time there. Training to be a journalist, not particularly a reporter. I got there because um, the editor, Reggie Thompson, uh, was a friend of my father, so it was really through my father that I got the appointment. Um, I was paid just four pounds a week, which was very little even in those days, but as a trainee I was still grateful. Uh, I. I had um, a digs in, in London because Chelmsford wasn't a very inviting place to have digs in uh, and all the best people lived in the villages outside Chelmsford in those days and uh, so I would come down on the train uh, at the appointed time and um, the offices were right in the centre of Chelmsford um, facing the Shire Hall and everything took place there. There was a, quite a small room where um, the journalists sat and the editor Reggie Thompson had a separate room behind, but all the compositing and printing took place in that one building. So in your time at the Essex Chronicle offices in, in Chelmsford, it was all hot metal printing in those days, wasn't it? Liner types and such mm -hmm. like. Yes, indeed it was. The linotype, which you uh, typed out, or the, the compositor, or the, the, the journalist, no, what would you the be? The keyboard operator. No, the keyboard operator would uh, tap out uh, a line, and literally a line of type would uh, switch back and produce the next line for you to, to type out. And then there was the room for the compositors, where um, each letter was chosen to make up the headlines. And finally, there was, I think it's called the stone, where the assistant editor would have a last look on the proofs uh, before it went to press. I think it came out on a, on a Friday, and so it would have printed on a Thursday. Your father, Ruby, he used to work with Reggie, didn't he, at the Daily Express, wasn't it? Well, my father knew Reggie perhaps at a distance. Um, he was, uh, uh, my father was a, a, a normally called James actually, um, his second name, and he um, would have been uh, working as, as a writer in his so called spare time as well as being a journalist. He was the editor of a paper called The Sunday Referee, I think, in those days. Previous to that, he'd been the editor of Everybody's Weekly, which was a popular journal in those days. Um, I'm not sure how he knew Reggie. I don't think my father was on the Daily Express, although there was a time when he was working on one of the National Fleet Street papers, uh, earning, I believe, three pounds a week, which sounds incredible nowadays. So your father was a newspaper man. Was that your inspiration to go into print yourself? Um, I actually studied classics at university, um, which doesn't... It's a good background, I think, and I believe the British Empire was administered by classic, classical scholars, but um, it nowadays doesn't lead to anything, it's just something to enjoy in your background. And in those days, the men's colleges were headhunted for jobs, but the women's colleges were not. In fact, we were told that uh, there was uh, secretarial work or something called a hospital almoner, and have you considered teaching? And I thought. Temperamentally, I would be suited to journalism, and I have never looked back. Well, I actually worked up to, up till I was 78 and a quarter, so I haven't really been retired all that long. Um, I first 
after the Essex Chronicle, I went to London and to Tidbits. Um, this was still fairly close to the end of the war, and I believe that um, the paper, Tidbits, got uh, an extra consignment of uh, newsprint, and so I was, they were able to take on another person. Um, I had not worked a lot as a reporter. I'd mostly been in the, in the office working as a, as a sub-editor and so on. The Herbert National Fact spent a lifetime in print. So Primrose, during your time at the Chronicle offices, Reggie Thompson, or RJ as some people called him, was the editor. What kind of man was he? Well, he was uh, very friendly and very focused on teaching journalism as, as far as I'm concerned. I remember he said, and I believe this is came from his experience on the Daily Express, or the Evening Standard, I think it was, uh, that there was story in the first paragraph, in the beginning God, he always said, uh, quoting, of course, the Bible. And um, I remember there was, he, yes, found a rather attractive young girl whom he immediately uh, asked to be, be a reporter on the, the paper. Not the Exit Chronicle, there was another smaller paper called the Evening Gazette, I think it was. And um, I'm not sure I ever got anything in print, but anyway, I worked for these other places. And this um, attractive young girl was called Marlene Dietrich Ruth Riemann. And uh, she didn't actually come into work a lot because she liked lying in the sun. And eventually, of course, Reggie fired her. And Mrs. Riemann came into the office waving her umbrella and stormed into the editor's room. And uh, so Reggie Thompson got up, he's not a particularly tall man, and he said, Madam, I don't think we have anything to say to one another. And so it gives a little, little picture of what he was like. Reggie's son-in-law, Ray Handley, he was the deputy editor yes. of the Chronicle. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about him? I'm trying to remember him. He was sometimes called Major, so that he must have served, and I'm not quite sure where he served during the Second World War. Um, he was married to Reggie's daughter, Sheila, and uh, he was also um, fun to work with, um, and everybody was very, very friendly with everybody else. Uh, we were a fairly small group. I I think there were only about three or five people who served as journalists or writers. Um, and there were a couple of photographers. I know one was called uh, Ronnie Crow, and the other one who was really rather handsome, and I've forgotten his name. Um, so we were quite a small group, rather jammed together in this small room, but it worked very well. Um, I don't know that I remember a lot of stories about uh, Ray Handley. I do know uh, we were all impressed that one day he said he was going into the um, courtroom and the Shah Hall was just opposite to us to uh, see the judge put on his black cap. So we were quite impressed with that. It must have been almost near the time when judges put on their black caps. I understand you had other reporters there, the likes of Freddie Tapp, Jack Chaplin, and Bernard Webber. I don't remember uh, Bernard Webber coming in a lot. I don't think he was, he must have worked mainly somewhere else and come into the office. Um, Freddie Tapp was there, he was comparatively elderly. Um, really very deaf, and I remember R Reggie taking up a, a position opposite him and, and actually sort of shouting between his hands d to get him to hear what he wanted to tell him. Um, and um, Mr. Tapp wrote for a penny a line, I remember. Um, who was the other person you mentioned? Um, Jack Chaplin. Oh yes, Jack Chaplin. Well, again, he was a reporter outside the office. I think he covered um, sport and various things, so he was in the office occasionally. And I do remember on one occasion I was sent 
just as a trainee to, to observe um, what was going on in the court. And on that particular occasion, um, there was a, 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 a sex case of some kind, I don't quite remember, but I know everyone was rather goggle-eyed, but Mr. Chaplin wasn't really taking a lot of interest in this. I noticed he was busy writing, and eventually he looked up and said, not much in this, miss, I'm catching up on my football reports. Okay. Um, you did a bit of feature writing, didn't you, and court reporting, is that right? I did some court reporting later on at Whitton. Um, I used to go there, I think it was on a, on a Tuesday, and that um, I remember one occasion, oh yes, I even remember the names, but let's not give names. There was some, there was a, a car accident at Rettendon, and the driver of one of the vehicles was killed, and uh, there were two people who came as witnesses, and one of them said that he, he was, was Jewish and wasn't going to um, take an oath on the New Testament. So it was a great to-do to find a Bible that wasn't a New Testament so he could take the oath, I remember that. Not quite sure it was the same occasion, but anyway, that was happened on one occasion. And there was another occasion where one of the witnesses was, was a hedger and ditcher. I don't know whether there are such people now, but there were then, keeping the roads tidy. And he had a very broad Essex accent. And people who hadn't been in Essex as long as I had had no idea what he was saying. I understand also you, you covered a, a fatal road accident involving a car and a bus. Well, that might have been that. I do remember something similar. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't go out and cover anything on the road. Um, that's true. But I remember being in the office one day and the telephone ringing and I picked it up and there was an extremely angry person on the other end that the, a reporter had turned up at the house after a road accident, I'm not sure whether it was fatal, before the police had come. And so that had to be sort of listened to and dealt with. So during the Second World War, Reggie's father, mother and one of his brothers, who was running the, the Essex Chronicle at the time, were all killed, weren't they? That's right, a, a, a bomb landed on their house and uh, at that time Reggie Thompson uh, was managing e editor, I think, of the Evening Standard, so he came down to Essex to look after the paper. There was a, another brother, Robert, who was rather precious and I don't think was interested in actually running the paper, although he did, I'm not quite sure what he took part in. I remember him being there and on several outings. So, what, what are your most enduring memories of your time at the Essex Chronicle offices in the, in the High Street? I suppose they are a bit jumbled. There was a pub called the Saracen's Head opposite to us, which was very popular, I think, with Ray Handley going out there at lunchtime. Um, I didn't go. I went for coffee with the girls. Um, I was very friendly with one of the girls called Rossi, whom I still know. I don't remember her maiden name. And then there was Doris, who uh, had an affair with an American airman. There were plenty of American airmen at the air bases not very far away and she had a baby um, which didn't seem to bother her. Um, by this time it was known that this airman was in fact married and um, Doris was very keen on a, a local MP, Tom Dryberg, who I think most people knew was not really interested in ladies, uh, but this wasn't known to Doris and she was determined that uh, he, Tom Dryberg, should be the godfather to this infant. And um, the MP agreed, and he was. 
Okay. Do you want me to go on talking about other people? Now? Yes, by all means. Another person there who became a great friend of mine, in fact I am the godmother to one of her children, was Pat Kelly from Colchester. Um, a very pretty uh, girl and certainly with a lot of sex appeal. And uh, I think Reggie was so impressed with her looks that he made her, uh, um, I think, an editor under Ray Handley. Uh, but she soon moved to London because there was a program on the, uh, it must have been on television, something you looked at, called What's My Line? And uh, Pat went up to this. And of course, uh, then she caught the attention of uh, was that a famous editor of the of the Express who immediately hired her? Um, you probably remember his name. I what I do remember about her uh, about him is that um, there was a, f a flight of the comet which crashed and killing everyone on board, but for some reason this editor had not taken that flight, although he was expected to, so there he still was. But anyway, he caught sight of Pat and immediately hired her. Um, but al although she was very attracted, attractive to numerous boyfriends, she was also, um, had women friends, well, including me, uh, until her sad death a few years ago. Uh, then there was Elizabeth, uh, now Elizabeth, I think, took the this minor editor's role or sub-editor, perhaps chief sub. I don't remember. After um, Pat went to London, um, and she had a she wasn't as friendly as Pat, but anyway, she was very good. Now, what else do I remember? I. Th I th I think that's about all that comes to my mind at this moment. Um, I think um, I could mention, not in our editorial office, but down in the front office, there was Miss Monday, um, who was a, a very keen guide, or I suppose she would be a ranger, she was in her 50s. And because she was known as Miss, people used to think she was a young girl, but she wasn't, and she was a very strict guide. And we had a van driver called Mr. L. Founder used to take us out on trips if we needed to go anywhere to... Well, it must have been something that he needed to be at as well. I wrote a story about your involvement in the Essex Chronicle back in 2001 and arranged for you to visit the, the Chronicle offices at Westway in Shelton yes. when Stuart Rawlins yes. was the managing editor there. Did that visit stir any memories for you of your days in the High Street, or had things changed so much since your days at the High Street that there was hardly well, any relevance for you? Well, the immediate um, centre of Chelmsford hasn't changed, I don't think. I think it's still the Shire Hall. Um, what was the shop there? Was it Bond? A big store there. No, I don't think that that has changed. I I know. So Primrose, during your time at the High Street offices there, uh, the Chronicle covers stories like the death of King George the Sixth and the coronation of Queen Elizabeth the Second, and I believe you've got some memories of that. <laughs> well, I'm okay. Oh, it's, really? it's filming, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Carry on. No, you don't need to. It's all on remote now. Ask the question oh, again. Oh, okay. Ask the question I'll again. Ask the question again. Okay. Primrose, during your time at the Chronicle in the High Street there, um, this, you've, the paper featured some major uh, royal stories, including the death of King George VI and the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. What memories do you have of those stories? I don't remember exactly what the uh, Chronicle printed on those occasions, but I do, of course, remember being there. I remember we f first heard about the death of the king, perhaps before people did generally, and that I rang my mother to tell her. And I also remember being there on Coronation Day, because it wasn't a holiday for us, 
and whilst my uh, mother had made a, a trip to London to actually view the coronation, um, I was still in the office. I understand, Reggie, but we gave you these tips when you first arrived, again, about getting the main point of the story across in the first few paragraphs and such like. What else did he advise you? I mean, was he, was he a, a, a good sort of teacher for, for a, a trainee reporter such as yourself? I think he was. I mean, in those days, um, I wasn't sent to a, a journalist school, which I would have been at a later time, but you learnt on the job. And um, one of the things that uh, a young person was sent to was to cover a funeral. And this, of course, was extremely difficult for someone who didn't actually live, say, in Chelmsford, because everybody at the funeral who knew who they were, but you didn't, and so you had to ask them, and then you had to, even worse, ask them how they spelt their name. Uh, so that was pretty difficult. And the, another occasion I remember was being sent to interview, I don't remember who, and getting there, and the, the person was quite frightening. It was a, a man who said, what exactly did you want to know? And, uh, which was very off-putting, but I think I managed to ask some questions. Did you experience any sort of discrimination at being a young woman reporter? Was it mainly a man's world? Well, it certainly wasn't on the Chronicle. We all seemed to be female reporters. Um, and I suppose having, in my case, having been to university and having had really quite a privileged upbringing, I was someone with a lot of confidence, so I wouldn't have been put off. I think I was put off later in London when um, I couldn't have joined the MUJ because I wasn't earning enough and I wasn't earning enough because I was a woman. Um, so I think I, I can't remember how I got into the MUJ, but uh, well, eventually after a few years they gave equal pay to men and women. That was after I'd left Tidbits and I was working on Homes and Gardens magazine as chief sub. All right. So Primrose, a trainee reporter, can you recall how you were able to afford paying for your digs in London, your transport to and from Chelmsford? What, was money tight? Well money was certainly tight and in those days young people expected to be poor but uh, my father certainly helped me. In fact, I, in those days, I'm not sure there were university grants because my father paid for me to go to university. Um, I do remember that the, the bus fare from my digs in Pimlico to Liverpool Street, um, the bus fare was sixpence, which was, I think, is that the Tuppence Hayton Day today? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so that gives you an idea of the, the cost of things, but even so, no, I couldn't have managed on four or pounds a week. And what would, what would you do, say, for instance, for meals? I mean, did you have to go into the town to, to get something to eat each day? I think we got something in, in the, the, the cafes where we went out to have coffee. You must have got a sandwich, I think. Yeah. I don't remember eating a lot. I might have sometimes got back um, London quite late. In those days one was not afraid of walking in the dark in London, um, which one wouldn't do now. Um, the other thing is that the trains were considerably worse than they are today. And I remember one occasion, uh, it was rather wintry and rather foggy, and I got to uh, Chelmsford Station to go back to London, and there was a, a train coming in, and I said, oh, is this the six o'clock train? And the uh, man said, no, this is the four o'clock. So it gives, <laughs> gives an idea of what it was like. I don't think I was um, given really late things to do. No. So what, what sort of time would you start work in the morning? I suppose I would have got there about 9.30, I suppose. And you would work until when? 
would that be 5.30? Yeah. But, uh, Prim Rose, uh, part of a requirement really for working as a reporter these days is to have a good knowledge of shorthand, touch typing and such like. Did you have any of those skills? I, yes, I decided I hated shorthand because the sound that the symbols were supposed to make didn't seem to be or weren't as adaptable as, as the sounds of the English language when you were speaking it. Since you finished in the newspaper industry, the, the industry in actual fact production wise has changed dramatically over the years, you'll be aware of that. Do you still think there is a future for the newspaper industry uh, in these days of social media? Yes, I think there certainly is, because there will always be people who want to sit down with a paper they can feel and handle and turn to, say, the crossword page or reread what it said about uh, uh, a sporting hero and more interesting for them than to just take it off online. That's my feeling, anyway. Uh, newspapers aside, you've had a fascinating life, haven't you? I mean, I understand that you were educated briefly in Switzerland as a child. Yes, that's very true. I'm old enough to be a child in the days when there were governesses uh, and my parents were very keen on educating their children. Um, I, we had three German Fräuleins and there were two English uh, governesses and uh, one French. And so at the age of nine I was sent off to an international school at St. Moritz where we spoke German all the time and did lessons in French. Mm -hmm. And I think at that age you just got on with it. I don't think one has a very wide vocabulary at the age of nine and so it's possible. Mm. And then, of course, the war came along. Yes. Hitler marched into Austria mm -hmm. and your father took quite drastic action, didn't he? Well, like uh, many parents, after Dunkirk, it was decided that we should uh, go to America. And uh, my father stayed in London, but I went with my younger brother and my mother. Uh, first of all, uh, to Fredericton in New Brunswick, Canada, where we had a distant cousin whom we'd not met before, called Aunt Sophie. Uh, and because we had to get a, a quota visa um, in order to stay in America for any length of time, we only had a transit visa. Um, but eventually we got them. We, of course, we crossed the Atlantic by boat um, in a convoy to New York, where friends of friends met, met us, and there was a world fair going on, so that was quite interesting to see all those things. Uh, then to Canada, then with the quota visa, we crossed right across America four days on a train to Los Angeles where we had friends where we stayed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I mentioned this to you before, but the, uh, the person we knew was called Wheeler Dryden and he'd known my parents in India. My parents were born, brought up and married in India and um, Wheeler Dryden was the son of a travelling actor. Um, I think he was called Leo Dryden Wheeler, and so Wheeler Dryden turned his names around. And um, Wheeler discovered, possibly on his father's deathbed, that he had the same mother as Charlie Chaplin. So he wrote to Los Angeles, and Charlie and Sid Chaplin thought this was uh, a, a bit cheeky, didn't know who, is, who it was, but eventually he off he went to Los Angeles and by the time we got there um, Wheeler was the managing director of their studio. And uh, do you want me to go on about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, and so we stayed there for, now it would have been about October 1940 until April 1941, I think. Um, it was quite a small house. They had a, a small sum, um, this couple, Wheeler and his wife had a, a little boy called Spencer. And um, it was quite a small house. My brother was very lively 
And although a school was found for me, um, it wasn't found for my rather naughty brother until one day they did find the school uh, where my brother lasted for one day. Um, and he came back in the afternoon looking very proud. He said, hello, I'm the head boy. And so my mother said, don't be ridiculous, you've only been there one day. And she thought, well, this is Hollywood, they are a bit daft here. So she rang them up and it was all true. And because my brother had been sent off at the age of seven to a school where he'd done a bit of Latin or something, um, they made him head boy. And so, of course, my mother took him away again. So that was his one day at school. Um, meanwhile, I have, was found uh, a girls' school. Um, no, that was somewhere in West... It's called West Lake. Well, in some part of Los Angeles, anyway. And in my class there was um, Shirley Temple, who was a very famous six-year-old. Sadly, she recently died. And um, she was in my class. And it, it was rumoured, I think wrongly, that people helped her with her homework. I'm sure they didn't, because she was extremely bright. In fact, she was said to have an enormously high IQ. And as we know, she lately became, later on in her life, she became an ambassador. But she was um, very friendly in the class. This was grade eight for 12 year olds. And um, at Christmas, she gave everybody a, a little present. I had a little <coughs> comb uh, which was slotted into a case. Unfortunately, I lost it. But I've got her um, signature somewhere in a birthday book, if I can remember where I put this thing. I should mention that your father was uh, not only a writer, he was also a film producer and uh, some of his uh, stories made, made the grey, didn't they? It, Carve Her Name of Pride, Clive of India and the Wicked Ladies, they were all well-known Hollywood movies in the yes. 30s, 40s and 50s, weren't they? Well, he, he wrote Clive of India um, in the 30s um, because, I mean, we, we were pretty my parents were pretty poor, as, as, as people were uh, in their 20s or so. And when my parents first came to India, they were living in, in Dulwich with uh, my father's uncle in, in, in one room, really. But with Clive of India, which was a big success, he had enough money to come to Lawford and buy a house here. And it was made into a film, and Ronald Coleman, who had to be everybody, had to be Clive. Um, and his other later success was A Carve Her Name, um, which he wrote. He got the story, I don't know whether I mentioned this, one of my neighbour's father, uh, well the neighbour's called Hugh Naylor, he's about my age, he's 80, but his father, Colonel Naylor, was the um, person who trained Violet, who was the heroine We're of this. We're talking about Violet Zaba, aren't yes, we? Yes, the heroine of this um, the SOE story, Special Oper Operations Executive, is that right, SOE? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the Wicked Lady, he was simply a producer of, mm. but it, ha it also had a success as a film. He did, he did screenwriting as well. Um, uh, Stevie Smith, um, anyway, I can't... <laughs> At my age, I can't bring names quickly to mind, but anyway, he did some screenwriting as well. He had some big names in the films, so James Mason, I believe, was in one James of Mason was just certainly uh, in, in Liquid, Wicked Lady, and Margaret Lockwood was the Wicked Lady, yes, yeah. yes, right, yes. So he enjoyed all the success from... He did. Yes. Which, of course, helped you as a young woman when you were going through university and... Yes, it certainly did. One, one memory I have was that the opening night, I think it was of The Wicked Lady, was in April 1945, and in those days, in first nights, or in the cinema generally, there was always a, a news clip before the main film. And this news clip showed um, the uh, famous um, report of Richard Dimbleby on the opening of Belsen. Um, the Russians went into Auschwitz in January 1945, but we didn't see any report of that. And this was the first time we'd actually seen what it was like to go into a concentration camp. 
And I do remember that my younger brother was absolutely shocked by these pictures. But I, my reaction was I saw what I expected to see, and looking back on it, why was I so sure? I, I know that my father and many others knew what Hitler was up to even before 19, well, well before 1939. Um, these, this must have filtered through to me, yes. Primrose, you might not be aware, but the Chronicle first saw a light in 1764. And this summer, 2014, it will be 250 years old. And in August, there's going to be an exhibition of Chronicle artefacts at the museum in Chelmsford. And we'd very much like you to be our guest of honour. Would you like to come along? Thank you very much. Yes, of course, I would like it. Um, I hope there will be somebody more interesting as guests of honour, or uh, perhaps I could just be a minor one. But uh, yes, it would be very interesting. Primrose Willie, thank you very much.